Hi everyone, welcome to this studio. Um, first of all, I'm going to ask you, please turn off your mobile phones or at least turn it down as much as you can so nobody can hear you and hear the vibrate. We're getting a lot of complaints on mobile phones and that's, that's just not fair. So, thank you, please. Um, we're going to have, beginning with the shell with Peter Chobb, um, Peter is one of the um, Linux and Unix users which are around for a long time. He has been around um, since the Manchester Computer Center distribution in 1992 and using Linux and before that he was using Unix. Now um, he is working in embedded systems programming and he was one of the founders and people who helped founded SLOG Sydney Linux Users Group, which me and one of my friends and, and many other people are now members. So I'm happy to announce the talk. We'll have a 90 minute talk. Um, will we have any rest in between? No. Okay, so a, um, a full 90 minutes talk. So we're about to start. Okay. <laughs> this is a tutorial, not a talk. I forget, I'm so used to public speaking without a microphone. Um, I'm going to spend about five minutes talking about what the shell actually is. Then we're going to go into the real basics that lots of beginning shell programs get wrong. Things like how to do quoting, how the shell breaks whatever you've got in your command line into, um, in, into arguments and then does something with them. How redirection works. We're going to spend quite a bit of time in that at the beginning. Then we're going to start looking at how to use it for scripting. And we're going to produce a few shell scripts that you're going to type in and try out and modify and see how things work. And finally, depending on how much time we have at the end, we're going to try and review some code that I've written, which you can get already if you've already grabbed the tarball off the wiki, um, and see how to put together a larger shell program and modify it to do something more interesting. You can think of the shell as the shell of a nut. You've got the kernel in the middle and the shell around the outside, like this walnut. Originally, back in the 60s, 70s, when Unix and other operating systems were fairly new, the shell was privileged. And there were lots of things you could only do through the shell. Uh, and that's still the case for things like VMS, where the JCL lets you set up which files attach to which logical units. And within your program, you've, you can only refer to logical unit numbers. You can't refer to file names. But that changed around about 6th edition Unix when they realized they didn't actually need to have a privileged shell. So the shell turned from being this thing around the kernel to being a thing that users live inside of. What's going on here? Oh, hang on. Try that. Yeah. So it's like a hermit crab. You live inside the shell and you reach out from it to do stuff. So every uh, login on a Unix system has associated with it a program which is that user's shell. Usually it's some kind of command interpreter, but it doesn't have to be. Back in the days before X was common, that shell could quite easily be some sort of internal GUI environment that the secretaries use to do correspondence, or the accountants use to do their accounts payable. It doesn't have to be a command line interpreter, but it usually is. Now that we've got X environments, when you log in, you get a GUI environment of some sort. So you could think of the shell as something like this. It's a radiation suit to prevent you from all that nasty, gooey, RGB radiation that's coming from your screen. And when you've got this, then your GUI becomes the environment that tells you which command line you're going to be typing into next. So, this diagram is really, really common. It's pinched from one of the um, basic operating systems books. You've got the kernel in the middle, the shell sits around the outside, you live in the shell most of the time, and it forks off other tools that you use to do your work. But what the shell really is, is glue. 
It's a command line interpreter, but its real strength comes when you start using it to glue other things together. In order to be glue, you have to understand that almost every Unix program has some built-in interprocess communication stuff. Every Unix program has an exit status, and by convention, zero means I did what you asked me to do. Any other number means I didn't do what I, you asked me to do. And every Unix process that's designed to be used with the shell has a number of standard file descriptors, zero, one, and two. Standard input, standard output, and standard error. We'll be going into those in much more detail later. But for now, there are a huge number of command interpreters you've got. I'm not going to talk about any of these in particular. What I am going to do is concentrate on the POSIX subset that is common in almost all shells. There are a few exceptions. Uh, the, the hush shell that comes with BusyBox isn't fully POSIX compliant, for example. But most of them, most shells that you'll get, are POSIX compliant if they're not C shell. Right? This is important. Common systems like Debian are now replacing Bash as the system shell with Dash. Dash is still POSIX compliant, but it doesn't have all those Bash extensions. So we're only going to be looking at the POSIX subset. So, I've already gone through that lot. I want you to start typing in this program there in a file called bang. I'll give you a few minutes to type it in. You may or may not have the banner program on your system. If you don't, replace banner there. This is a brighter light. Replace banner there with echo. It won't look as good, but hey. Um, where? No, there's no full stop there. That's a. It's a bit of blue tack on the screen. <laughs> Uh, it's just seven or eight spaces. You could put a tab there if you wanted, it doesn't matter. One of the interesting things about this program is that all those red ones are not part of the shell. They're all external commands. If you want to use the shell effectively, then you need to start learning about the plethora of Unix commands that are available that you can use with the shell. I'll just go through them very briefly. tput, it stands for terminal put, and it puts special characters onto your screen. Its arguments, in this case clear at the top there, clears the screen. cup is cursor position, and then you give it an x and y accent number in columns and things. Test is an all-purpose program that tests various different things. In this case, we're testing whether a number is bigger than zero. Banner just prints things up in big letters. Sleep does what you'd expect. And the most interesting bit is this bit here, this construct. Everything inside these parentheses is a command, is a complete command line. What that does is it expands the value of x, expa then sees whatever that value is, the minus sign and a 1, and it executes that. So if it, x had the value 9, it would then print 8 to its standard output. The dollar parenthesis construct says, take whatever the output is and interpolate it here into the shell's input. So the net effect of that is to reduce x by a value of 1. If you've done that correctly, then when you run it using either shirt dot slash bang or chmod plus x dot slash bang then dot slash bang, you should see something like this. Except I started at 10 instead of 9. And I added a few extra bits at the end just to be a surprise. 
Okay. Um, as a brief note, I have a banner in the BSD games package. Yes, that's a different banner. Okay. Um, CSV banner. Yeah, we want the System 5 banner for this one. The BSD banner prints things horizontally and much, much bigger, and it's designed to be printed out on a line printer so you can have a great big banner. Whereas this one just prints it out big. Uh, and the SysV banner was originally designed to write banner pages for LP commands. So when your printer comes out, you can see your name at the front uh, and see it really easily in the stack of, um, of okay, paper yeah, there. SysV banner. I think I've heard it up. Yeah, there. The on the there. Is SysV banner into BN and Ubuntu? I don't know what it is in Fedora. Okay, just called banner? Okay, great. Anyway, um, you've had your first shell script. Let me see where we go next. Have we grabbed this yet? If you haven't, grab it now and unpack it. It'll save you some typing if you've got it. Can I, can I go on to the next slide? Uh, it's on the wiki if you can't find it here. I'll just leave it there for a bit. Okay, everybody got it? Anybody not got it? Okay, cool. You often want to be able to find out what you can do. Almost all your systems will have the manual, the, the, the Unix manuals installed. Other things you can do with test, man test, and it'll tell you that you can test things like whether a file is newer than another file, what kind of a file a file is, how big it is, whether it's zero size, whether it's a symbolic link or a real file, whether uh, two numbers are the same, whether two strings are the same. And the very simplest one is whether a string is of zero length or not. Man-K keyword is really, really useful. That will tell you all the manual pages that have that keyword in their header. And that's useful for finding out things. So if you want to do about um, terminal control, you might say man-K terminal, and you might find teapot in there. And of course, man should will tell you whatever your current standard shell actually can do. There are lots and lots of other commands. You need to learn them. All right. Now, how the shell learns, reads commands? It reads them one line at a time. The first thing it does when it gets a line of, shell, of, of um, stuff is tokenize it. Let's divide it on white space into tokens. And not just white space, but also other syntactic elements. Once it's done that, it looks for dollar signs and expands parameters and variables. Then it looks for globs, that's wildcards, stars and question marks, and, it, and looks in the current working directory for files that match those things and expands those and interpolates them. Then it looks for backtick or the dollar parenthesis constructs and expands them. <laughs> there is, yeah, probably. Um, it then splits the result into words again based on white space, splits the result of that into jobs and then runs each job. Exactly what that means we'll come to later. Let's have an example. Let's say you type this, this little thingy. First thing it does is split into tokens and there are the token boundaries. It then looks for this construct that's not present in all shells. It's a slight extension. The POSIX standard says it may or may not be there. Um, test with your shell has it. It's quite useful. Um, I suggest you just try echo that. So try, uh, yeah, that's what right, well.
and see what comes out. What did the first system be called the billing records? That's an A, but it doesn't, that doesn't have to be there. Do I need to put the lights up? Just the bottom medium. Yeah, that might be easier to see. And what you'll see is that uh, it expands these and then forms the cross product of the two sets. And you get all of those in the, in the thing. Oh, it should do. It should do both of them. Pardon? Yeah, don't need a second one for me too. Okay, worked for me. Oh, hang on, it should be dot dot. That's what. Yeah. Sorry, wrong syntax. Thing is, it's your dot dot. I had it, had it right on the slide. <laughs> dot dot. My fault. That's useful, for example, when you're generating lots of file names and you're, say, splitting a file uh, into to multiple bits. You can just use it. For this little thing. Anyway, um, I'll go back to the presentation display. So we've done that. We then look for, so we've done the expansion. Now we look for dollar things. In this case, home is a standard variable that's got your home directory in it, the name of your home directory. So we expand that. Now we're going to look for, for glob expressions. There's a star there. So we're going to look for things that start with A, B, or C. In this case, we happen to have some things beginning with A, but nothing beginning with B. So if there's nothing that matches, the shell just passes it through unchanged. Finally, we'll look in the special path variable for ls. It'll find it eventually in slash bin, and actually exec this line. You'll note that the shell has done all the expansion before the exec. The kernel does not expand anything. You'll note also that the shell has decided where the argument boundaries are. Okay, any questions at this point? Yep? Are these slides going to be available? Yes, the slides are going to be available. In fact, one of the last steps in this tutorial will be to run a shell script that will fetch the slides for you. Yeah. Is the first place to search the path environment variable? Yes. What if it's a built-in or something? Um, if, okay, I haven't talked about built-ins uh, because in general you can treat them just as everything else. Depending on the settings of your shell, it may or may not put built-ins first. Hmm. But that, you can change that with settings. Okay. Second example. Please either type this in, or you can find a copy of this in the shell shoot examples to save you typing. Have a look at it. And then try out the examples. See if you can guess what the results are going to be before you do it. Because now we're going to start talking about shell quoting. Did you say this was in that tower? Yep. Cool. It's called Echo. <coughs> Or my echo. Is that e of the line? Yeah, probably. Yeah, echo line. Um, I just, if you're going to type it in, you may as well use a shorter, shorter word. Um, when I first started on Unix, we had uh, ASR33 typewriters, teletypes, uh, which have like round buttons that you've got to press almost vertically to make them work. Uh, touch typing on those is totally impossible. And so. You, tr you get into the habit of making your commands as short as possible. Which is why so many Unix commands are one or two letters, or three letters. And the, the standard editor used to just be E. All right, so if we do this command, what's going to happen? The, the effect, by the way, of echo is just to send whatever you've got to standard output as a separate line. For says set x and iterate through all the arguments of this shell script. So maybe for four we put it over, so four just works on the argument of the shell script here. You can change that, but yes, if you don't do anything else it'll just act on the arguments of either the shell script or the function that it's in. What's the explicit way of doing that? I'll come to it later. Okay. 
So, if you do this, what you're going to get? Who's tried it? Yep. So you get one per line. And where do the argument boundaries go? Uh, a, B, those are individual arguments. C, D is one argument. D, that's one argument. G, H. Cool. That's right. And in this case, do you get the same thing or not? We're going to set this into a shell variable and try it. Okay. It all comes down to the order in which the shell does things in terms of its tokenization. So I suppose the double quotes inside of the script around our X are meaningful. Yes. Yes. Why are the single quotes at the bottom? There's a relationship there. There's a different meaning for them. Try it out and see. And you saw the difference? Yes, so the single quoted one appears as dollar X. Yes. Yes. Inside double quotes, you'll find variable expansion and backtick expansion works. Inside single quotes, those special characters are turned off. Oh, so those are single quotes. Those are single quotes. Those are double quotes. So what's the purpose of the double quotes inside of the script? On the ah. Try removing them and see what happens. Sorry. The question was, what... What's the double quotes in there for? Try removing them and seeing what happens. Particularly um, if you have some extra space in one of these. Put, put ten spaces there instead of two, instead of one. You should actually get the trick from, from, from this line. Um, when you executed this one, you should have seen first the letter A, then shell, then variable as individual lines because after you've done the dollar $x, that's expanded and then the shell goes through again and splits things up into words and then you've got three arguments where before you had just one variable. If it's in here, then dollar $x becomes as many words as were in the um, argument. So echo sees that many arguments and puts them all on set of output with just one space in between them. So all the white space that was in the argument gets lost. That's really important that this is a file name. So the quotes, quotes are in the dollar X have the effect of preserving white space? Yes. Because if you think about what's happening, let me go to the presentation uh, meeting mode again. Yeah, um, you've got dollar $x, and that expands to a shell variable. And that is then one argument to echo, including all the white space. Okie dokie, let's go back to presentation mode so we can all sit in the dark. Well, I mentioned these before. Unix works on an inheritance model. In every process has a parent, except for the initial process that started up by the, sh the kernel. The, when a process is created, it inherits most of its attributes from its parent. In particular, it inherits all the open file descriptors. That means that in the parent, you can set up where file descriptors 0, 1, and 2 go, and then the child can just use them. And that's how shell redirection works. The general format of a shell command is something like this. You've got the environment, then the command, then redirections. The actual order of those doesn't matter. Except that environment things are usually have to be first. There's a way of changing that. You can put them anywhere. But in general, put them first. So the first thing that happens is the environment. So you can set variables that will be seen by the command. Next, you've got redirections. Redirections look something like this. You've probably seen them before. Three onto foo says, open, open, file, open the file called foo, for writing, truncate it to zero length, and then assign file descriptor three to it. The two onto and three says, make file descriptor two the same as file descriptor three. So, what that actually does in the shell it's open file descriptor, so open foo, 
O create, O truncate. So it zeroes the length of that file. Then it does a dup2 of 2 onto file descriptor 3, and then it closes the file descriptor. Then it makes file descriptor 3 the same as file descriptor 2. And then it does the fork and exec. The general form is like this. For output, n is assumed to be 1 if you leave it off. For input, n is assumed to be 0 if you leave it off. So onto it creates the file, truncates it to zero length, and assigns it as to file descriptor n. Onto and just duplicates it. And onto and dash closes the file. All right. There's a really common idiom if you want to put standard error and standard output through a pipe, and that's to use the two onto and and through the, the pipe command, right? Because the pipe's done first, and then the redirections are done. Okay, any questions about that slide? There was a question at the back? No, okay. So, if you're a good typist, which I'm not, a really quick and dirty way to create a file is just this, cat onto slash whatever the file is, type in some random text, then hit control D. Control D is the end of transmission character. Unix and Linux, because it inherits it, sees a zero length read as end of file. So if you put a control D, which is end of transmission, at the beginning of a line, then whatever's reading from that will see an end of file. And so cat will then close the file and finish. Right? So that's a really easy way. What do you think that will do without a command? Nothing? Nope. Remember it does redirections before it does any... Um, uh, execing or looking up of stuff. It'll create a zero length file. Or if the file already exists, what's it going to do? Okay. Truncate it to zero length. If you're a sysadmin and you've got some log file that's suddenly grown to 10 million megabytes and it's filling up your disk and you want to fix that, what do you do? Do you remove the file? No, because it's still open and being written to. You do onto file and it truncates it to zero length and then you bang, you're ready. Yes. Yes. It's really useful. Okay, what about exec onto tempfu? I haven't explained exec yet. Exec replaces the current shell with another process. And you normally say exec, program, whatever. So what do you think that's going to do without any program there to exec? It truncates the file. Um, it, it opens the file, put nothing in it, and then terminates the shell. The suggestion is that it terminates the shell after creating the file and um, basically creating it. Basically, before creating the file, because it, it, it replaces the shell. Yeah. That's one possibility. It'll, redirect, it'll truncate the file, slash 10, slash 2, and redirect whatever the standard output of exec is into that file. That's correct. Now, what exec normally does is replace the current shell with another process. But there's no other process for it to be create, um, replaced with. So the effect is to replace the current shell's standard output with tempfu. So all output from <coughs> this, this shell is now going to go into slash temp slash foo. That's really useful if you've got some shell script that's being um, called deep in the bowels of some daemon. Like DHCP, DHCPD, as part of its work after it gets an address, runs a shell script. But it's running in the background as a daemon. Daemons don't normally have any standard input or standard output or standard ever attached. They're meant to use syslog to, to log things. But it's running a shell script. So what you do is you find that shell script that you're interested in and type in it exec onto slash temp slash my log file to onto and one. And then all the output and all the errors that come out of that shell go into that log file and you can look at them and find out what's going on. And that isn't propagated up to parents? Nope. Parents? It's not propagated up to parents. It's inherited by children. But it's not, you can't actually influence your parents' um, stuff. All you can do is influence your cell, own and your children's stuff. Pardon? How do you get out of it? How do you do, do another exec. So what you do, let me go back to here. Hmm, this is ridiculous. 
If you want to preserve the original standard output and standard error, what you can do is you say exec, uh, sorry, um, 2 onto and 7, say, onto and 6, 2 onto slash temp slash log, and then I've run out of space here, I'll put a backslash, um, onto and 2, right? And these are done in order left to right. So the first thing this says is, okay, let's make 7 the same as file descriptor 2, so we've saved it. Let's make 6 the same as file descriptor 1. Then let's make file descriptor 2 point to that log file. And file descriptor 1 be the same as file descriptor 2. And then later on when you want to undo that, you just say exec 7 onto, 7 onto and 2, um, 6 onto and 1, um, 7 onto and dash, 6 onto and dash, which closes file descriptor 7 and 6 and restores your 2 and 1 afterwards. Okay? So, interestingly, if I do this exec tempo here, uh, in next term, I still get my shell prompt and I can type and that's still in the X term, but the output of any command I launch yep. the file. Um, that's because you're using bash, and what bash does is it puts the terminal into a special raw mode so it can do command line editing. And so this is not quite effective because it's not actually reading and writing from standard input and standard output when you're typing that stuff. It's reading from its special terminal file that's in raw mode. So, okay, so it does a raw mode on a separate file descriptor. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's it could make standard input and output turn that into raw mode as well. Yeah, yeah. But it does it on a separate file descriptor. It, 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 it's really weird inside. I, I was a beta tester for Chet Ramey for ages doing bash stuff and uh, getting that right was really, really complicated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you use dash or ash or something. Okay, are we having fun yet? Uh, another question. Um, can you go into detail of the detailed command executed after this exec? Because it doesn't do anything. That's the whole point. All it does is set standard output for the current shell to be tempfu. Um, yeah. Okay. Talk to me after. That's yep. All right. Um, jobs. Jobs are things that the shell treats as a separate process group. That's the simplest way of thinking about it. So you separate jobs by new lines or ampersands or semicolons. Semicolons and ampersands are the same. They just mean sequential operation. Do A, then B. Ampersands say do everything in parallel. So if you do some long-running job and some other long-running job and, it starts both of them. Each process has an exit value, we've already said that. Each process is a process ID. You can do some things with these. Always zero means success, non-zero means I didn't do what you asked me to do. You can use the same kind of C, ampersand, ampersand, or pipe, pipe to execute things conditionally. And it's the same sort of shortcutting condition as it is in C. So, ampersand, ampersand says do the second command if the first command succeeded. Let's give an example. True or or false. Let's go back to this one. Yeah, no, that's right, yeah. yeah. True or or false. And then echo dollar question mark. Dollar question mark is a special variable that contains the exit value of the last command executed. True is a command that always exits zero. False is a command that always exits non-zero. They used to be really, really small shell scripts. Now they're huge programs. I don't know why. Mm. I mean, the, the, the implementation of true, this is funny, the implementation of true, um, used to be, in addition 6 Unix, that was it, in a shell script. And false used to be exit 1. Then they decided to put a copyright notice in. And is that even copyrightable? Yeah, it's copyrightable. Then it was um, this, then enormous copyright and license things, copyright. 
AT&T, this is licensed, it's not to be revealed to anybody and under pain of death or whatever. And the copyright thing, and then they realised they didn't actually need the colon, so they left it out. And so the true file was just a copyright notice. Because the default exit value of the shell is zero. Binary. Yeah. <laughs> That's stupid. No, it's got a copyright notice in it. The copyright notice is copyright. <laughs> uh, hang on, that's the wrong one. That one. Okay. So, if you do this, what are you going to get? Is it going to be zero or one? Who's tried it? Which, which one? The first one, that one there. Zero, that's right. Because the true executes, the all says don't do anything after this if we've exited zero. So the exit value of the whole thing is the exit value of the last one that actually got executed, which in this case is true. How about this one? That's right. Because you execute true, it succeeds, so you execute false, and false fails and you end up with one. What about a pipeline? This is, this is not conditional. This is going to start true, then start false, and pipe false into true. There's no output, so it doesn't really matter much. But It'll give zero. In general, unless something weird happens, the exit value of a pipeline is the exit value of the rightmost command in the pipeline. Okay, are we having fun yet? Yeah, good. So true doesn't have that much help. What? <laughs> okay. Um, in general, if you use a command that's designed properly, it will execute zero, exit zero if it does what you've asked it to do. So grep, which stands for globally find a regular expression and print, will exit zero if it finds what you asked, if it finds something, and did some printing out. In this case, I don't care what it finds. I just care whether it found something or not. So it's going to look for P to C and etc. password. And if it doesn't find it, it's going to print a message. Okay? Simple example. We talked about path a little bit. The format of path is a set of colon separated directories. So here we have a standard one, slash bin and slash user slash bin. Because they're the standard places in the system where um, executables are found. Some people put the current directory in their path, either with a dot or with two colons next to each other, because the empty one normally means the, cu the current directory. That's a really bad idea. One common trick used to be to create a file called ls that did something, and then call someone over and say, hey, look, um, there's something wrong in this directory. Can you, can you have a look at it in your account and make sure it's OK? And they'd go in, type ls to see what was there, that ls would be a Trojan, and if, it's in, in your path, in your, if the current directory is in your path, it would then execute under your credentials and do something. And you don't know what it did. So don't put dot in your path. That's especially true if you're root. There are a whole heap of other path-like variables. CD path is quite useful. This one must have dot in your path, otherwise you'll get really confused. When you type CD to change your working directory, the shell searches through CD path for the name of the file, the name of the directory that you just typed in. Normally you'll look in your current directory first, but then you can look in other places. This is really useful if you've got a large development environment and you've got heaps of uh, um, directories that are a long way away from each other and you want to be able to change them fairly quickly. Um, I often have slash media in my CD path, so then when I plug in a, a USB stick that calls SanDisk 15G, I, 16G, I can just say CD SanDisk 16G and it will know to go into slash media and, and go in there. Assume you've got AutoFS set up, right? Yeah, in, in your doc profile. Okay, another really useful one's mail path. Back in the days when you worked on a Unix system on a serial connection back to a shared machine, your mail got stored in var mail your name. And when new mail arrived, that mail file would be extended and its last modified date would change. Mail path is a way to say, when a particular file changes its modification time, tell me before the next prompt. So, 
I can set this to those things and when those files change, I'll get a message to say, you have mail at my next prompt. That doesn't have to be just for mail. If you've got, say, an Ubuntu type, as one of these netbook type thingies, where you're mostly using full screen apps, you still want to have this kind of notification. So I can set off a big compile in the background, and as its last step, I can say and and echo onto some signal file, and then have that signal file in my mail path, and then when I'm typing away doing stuff, when the comp compilation finishes, it will say you have mail. And I'll know that that's my compilation finished. I can go and look at it and see what's going on. But you can use it for anything that's logging. Anything that's going to change a file when something happens that you want to know. Did you have a question there? Yeah, um, just, regarding, just regarding CD path. Yep. Um, is that a environment variable that we have to set, or is that something that's set by default for the system? By default, the shell starts off with it just with a dot in it. Yep. Yep. But if it's empty or not set, it'll just be dot. It'll just be dot. Yep. Otherwise, you can set it and, you, and the shell will obey it. Yep. Exactly. Okay. I've already typed this in for you. It's called my witch, I think, in the in the original. This one introduces a new thing. I lied to you earlier, and nobody picked it up. When the shell does that second part to split, after it's done all the tokenization expansion and so forth, and it wants to split things into words again, it doesn't actually use white space. There's a special variable called IFS, the internal field separator, which normally contains a new line, a space, and a tab, and it splits based on the characters in that thing. Here, we're going to use a, a colon. And so when we go to the for dear in dollar path, dollar path will be split into words on those colons. So here, when you say for dear in whatever, it will iterate dear over all of the elements of your path. So the effect of IFS is specifically on for or on everything? It's on everything. Yeah. After you set... Argument for a subshell or... Yeah, it's, it's inherited by the subshell if you export it, so... And uh, subshell will use it to, part, to separate it on arguments? Yeah. So here, um, instead of separating on white space, that'll separate on colons. It's already passed the, done the initial tokenization, so it only really matters for things that it expands later on, like dollar path. This is a note. Does do have to be on a new line? Pardon? Does do have to be on a new line? Yes, it does. It either has to be on a new line or you have to have a semicolon there. Originally, it used to be a separate command, but now it's built into the shell. So essentially, here, you've changed the IFS into the column. Yes. Yes, and there is actually a bug in this program. Um, where's the bug? Can anybody see it? Well, dash x. No, no, the dash x is okay. Dash x is okay? You, yeah. you can call it the feature. You can call it the feature, yes. All right, the bug is that there's no double quotes there and there, and there and there, which means that if you happen to have a directory with a colon in it, things will go wrong, and it won't pick it up. Yeah, yeah, that's right. If, you, if your arguments have got colons in them. So, uh, dash x is okay simply because get up knows IFS? Well, no, no, no. It's because it's already been expanded by then. Um, the, the, the IFS is only used for that last stage in the expansion. So if we go back a long way, we have to go forward again through it all, after all this too. Aha, here we go. I've gone too far. <laughs> Let me go forward again. Here. This is the stage where IFS is used. By then we've already tokenized. So we already know that that dash X is a separate token. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, but I don't want to talk about eval because it's too complicated. <laughs> Let me go further forward. You can force it to reread it 
as from the beginning by using a valid at the beginning of a line. Great, but, <laughs> yeah. Where are we up to? Don't let me go too far. Oh yeah, yeah, here we go. So, if you type this and then use it in a command line, um, has everybody managed to get it in or find it? If I go back to here, so there it is. I said I've, I've made one change here. Um, if you can see that, I've used square brackets instead of test. Square brackets are exactly the same as test, it's just syntactic sugar. So if I say sh dot slash wh ls, it'll print out bin ls, which is where it lives. Um, can't find him layer. And it executes one if it can't find anything, which is even better. If I say M player, it still executes one. I should fix that, shouldn't I? There's a bug there, another bug there. If we do um, my witch, it does a little bit more. Um, my witch in there also sanitizes the path and gets rid of duplicates because sometimes you inherit a path that's got lots of different things in it. So I've added an extra shell function up there that works out whether each entry is already in path and sanitizes it so you've only got one of each possible directory in the path. Otherwise when you type my which you'll get three or four entries if something's if the, if something in the path more than once. Um, and this does a lot better about uh, quoting and things. It's still not perfect. Okay, let's go back to there. All right. Set. We've already seen that the shell scripts have arguments and you can get at them with four. You can actually change them inside your, um, inside your shell script. The tool to do that is set. If you just type set, it'll print out for you all of the arguments and all of the flags and all of the variables that are set and visible in the shell and in some shells it'll also give you all of the shell functions that are there standard and Debian puts hundreds in. So in uh, bash here, set packet to wc-l is uh, 14,939 Yes, it's a bit big. That's because Debian or Ubuntu, because they're almost the same at this point, puts lots and lots of standard functions in there. Uh, for doing things like expansion. So when you type um, XPDF to look at a PDF file, it knows to expand only .pdf files. And there's, there's lots and lots of scripting in there to do that stuff. Painful. Okay, there are three particular arguments in the shell that I want to bring to your attention. Dash X, dash V, and dash E. Dash X says, as you execute each job, show me what it is. Dash V says, as you read the job, as you read the, your input, show me what it is. And dash E says, when you get any kind of, when any kind of command that you're running executes non-zero, execute with the shell non-zero. Ex exit with the shell non-zero. What I suggest you do is try that which again with dash X. So if we go back to it, uh, here we go dash x dot slash w l s. Try that and see what happens. And if you do this, you can see why the shell exits non-zero. It's because after we actually find the one and echo it, we carry on and test some more at the end of the path. And now we can see why we're getting a non-zero exit status out of, the, out of the thing, even though we found the command that we wanted. Can anybody suggest how to fix that? Yeah, exit zero in there. So let's do that. Unless, unless you want to exit the non-zero code, then it does find the 
and now it works properly. Because you want commands to exit zero if they do what you ask them for. If you say which command and it finds it, then you say, yay, I've got it. And I can do something else. Okay? Yeah. Well, it is related, but not directly on top. Um, how does, if you do have the same binary in more than one location of path, how does the shell um, determine which one to execute? Oh, it's okay. Related, so how does the shell determine which variable to execute if it appears more than once in a path? It starts at the beginning of the path and searches linearly through it till it finds it. In practice, it also does some caching. So it doesn't have to search it every time. Um, yeah, yeah, we, we finish. Yeah. That's right, exactly. Um, and there is normally a built-in, uh, sorry, a standard command which that Ubuntu and Debian and all the rest provide that does exactly that. It just stops out of the first one. I personally want to see if there's more than one in my path and if they're shadowing each other. So I normally don't do that and have something a little bit more complicated that uh, does the right thing. So can you undo a set dash x? Yes. Set plus x, exactly. The question is, can you undo a set dash x? The answer is yes, set plus x. Okay, dash v is interesting too. Dash v displays things as it reads it, and it will print out each syntactically correct syn construct it finds. So if you've got a syntax error and you can't work out what it is, it's quite often useful to do shut-v of a um, file, and it will print out all the syntactically correct uh, constructs, and then it will stop. So the, one, the first one that's in your file that is not printed out is the one where the syntax error is. You can also say shut-n a file, and it will just do the syntax checks, and it won't actually do anything. Okay, here's another one. Another interesting little thing. Yeah, another question here? No, no, we are at the 47 minutes. Okay, cool. I'm halfway through, which is good. It's about where we should be. Getent looks up the Unix database for the password file uh, for whatever that entry is. Right? Now, you'll know the format of the password file. It's login name, colon, UID, colon, group ID, colon, whatever. So there's lots of fields separated by colons. Again, we use the trick, let's set the internal field separated to colon. And then we'll call set dash dash for all POSIX commands, says this is the end of the option arguments and the start of the real arguments. So the effect of this is to set $1, $2, $3, $4, $5, and so forth to the individual things within the password file. So we can then echo $1, which is the new dollar one from there, which is the login ID, has shell dollar seven, and the seventh field in the password field is the shell field. So you can use this type of technique to do very simple um, field splitting and, and commands. Uh, uh, it saves you from using awk or something like that. Okay, any questions about that? So uh, apparently the IFS is used by which thing? IFS is used here. When that gets expanded, it gets expanded to all those things with colons in, and then when the shell rereads it before executing set, it splits it into words based on the colons. So it starts with two or oh, one? One. And IFS is, if it's blank, false to? To space, tab, and new line. So white space? Yeah. So actually, IFS is a set of things between set. You get that many different characters in the week. Yeah, everything after it's set. Okay? All right, variable expansion. We've seen some variables, but they're more complicated. Um, if you've got a variable attached that you want to expand as part of a bigger word, you quite often want to delimit the variable name, and you do that with braces. Um, so, dollar variable name like that. That's not really useful if it's just used as is. It becomes very useful if you've got this variable name as a chunk of something that's much bigger. Let's say you're splitting your JPEGs up and you want to have something embedded in the middle of your file name. 
then you might want to use this. There's a number of special forms of variables. The most useful ones are these. You can read them, so I'm not going to go through them. But there's some other which are even more interesting. But let's do this first, using shell variables. This is just very, very simple things. Um, you can use a shell variable and it's expanded syntactically before things work. So it's like a macro in assembler. It's just expanded syntactically. There's nothing special about it. Um, so if I set foo equals home fed slash fred and then echo it, I get the same thing. I can then use it as an argument to cd and change directory to it. Um, I can set b to the name of a command, then just use $B and that will be expanded and then executed. So you can put a, a whole command or a whole command string inside a shell. Watch the quoting. Um, if this were more than just the name of the program, but the program plus the arguments, if you quoted there, it wouldn't work. Because the quoting would mean that that whole thing would be one file name that the shell would then go and try and execute. If you don't quote, then it'll be split up based on the, um, the white space or the current value of IFS, and it will actually get executed. So that's what you want. Cool. So if you, if you write B equals double quote something, yep. the double quote do get into the variable or not? No, they don't get into the variable. Yeah. They, they, get, they get through by the shell. That's right. So you want backslash double quotes if you want them in the variable. Yes. Or you can put the, the double quotes inside single quotes. Okay. The double quotes in a variable does not do the same thing. Uh, yeah. Double quotes. When you use the variable dollar b, uh, you use a double quote dollar b, double quotes, not the same thing. Double quote dollar b, double quote dollar b, double quote dollar b. Yeah, no, I understand. Okay. There's another question here. If you're doing something, um, I guess, which isn't very nice in a Unix Linux environment, but if you have, for example, the need to put a space into a variable, Yep. If you encapsulate that that quotes, they will put the the white space in the variable. Yes. But if you then that's a path to something, for example, um, if you execute that, will it automatically escape that white space and execute it as Okay. Or white space is only preserved if the variable is expanded inside double quotes. Okay. Otherwise it will not be preserved. Yep. So if you put the white space in double quotes and then execute it as you did just then, yep. um, it will automatically escape that white space and execute it as if you had typed in the command with a backslash. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. But try it out and experiment because sometimes you get surprised. Okay, sorry. Environment. Um, if I just say foo equals bar, that sets the variable in the current shell. And if I say set pipe through grep foo, because there's like 14,000 lines in the variable in the environment, I'll see the value that I just set. That's really nice. If I type env, which prints out the values in the environment, and env is a separate program, it doesn't see it. It doesn't see anything. So how do we get variables to be seen by children of the current shell? The answer is export. So if we export foo and then do it, we'll, try, we'll see it. In general, you can set variables and export them and they'll be visible to your children. They will not be visible to your parents ever. There's some other special forms. Um, I'm probably going to be overloading you here for a little bit, but don't worry about it. We'll be consolidating a bit later on. If I've got colon dash there, that says, have a look at parameter. If it's set, then use it. Use its value. If it's not set, Use the value, whatever that word is. And again, you can quote that however you want to put white space in if you need to. You can also use colon equals, which says, if the parameter is set, use its value. If it's not set, assign it the value that is word, and then use it. That's really useful for setting defaults. I'll show you in a minute. If you omit the, kernel, the, the colon, it'll only set te te test for not set, for, for, sorry, for non-null. It won't test for not set. So um, if you haven't set the variable at all, it'll use the default. If you've explicitly set it to null, an empty string, it'll use that value without the colon. No, no. That's right, it only tests for not set. That's what I meant to say. Okay, 
So I've got some things that uh, do things like this, right? So I've got some scripts that build stuff, that invoke make with particular arguments for compiling the kernel. And I quite often want to use a particular compiler. I can either type cc every single time, or I can have my script do something like this. cc colon equals gcc 4.0. And that means that this, if cc is not already set, it'll be set after that, and we can use it. Colon is a special command that does absolutely nothing whatsoever. It's like a no-op. But the side effects in its arguments are still carried out. So we'll still get this parameter substitution happening. Is colon a bash? It's a standard shell. Yeah. Exactly the same as true. Okay. Quoting. There are three forms of quoting. One, backslash. It just quotes the next character and removes any special meaning for it. If you're on a TTY line that uses backslash as its own quote character, sometimes you've got to double it. And if you're inside, if you're then feeding that into something which does regular expressions, which also expects backslashes to be quoted, sometimes you end up with eight backslashes where you only wanted one. But you can work it out. Single quotes say, turn off all interpretation of everything, with one exception, inside these, the, these quotes. The one exception is history expansion. I haven't talked about history expansion because it's not useful inside shell scripts. But the C shell used to have a way of remembering all the commands you typed and then recalling a particular one of them. And it did that using an exclamation mark. This is still in the bash. So um, let's go back up. Power, meeting. You lot probably just type control P or something when you want to see the previous command again and do something with it. But you can just easily type bang bang. And that will repeat the last command you did. If you want to just pick out the last word of the last command, you can say bang dollar. So you can say ls um, slash foo slash bar. Make sure it's the right thing that you want. Or you know it might be slash something really, really long that you've typed in there. And then you want to CD to it, so you say CD, bang, dollar, and it'll save you all that typing. Yep, that's really, really useful. The other one that's special is the up arrow or carrot, which is a substitution. Let's say I've said um, CD slash foo slash BR. Oh, that's not a good one. That's not a good one. BR3. And I meant to say bar 2, and it, this one says no such file or directory. I can just say up slash 3, up slash 2, and it says change the 3 to a 2 and then we execute the command. All right. When you're typing commands, these up arrows and bangs are interpreted before single quotes are interpreted. The only way to turn off their special meaning is with a backslash. No, it only does the first one. Yep. That's a full regular expression. You can put whatever you want in it. Is there a way to soft global it? Is there a way to what? Soft to global so that you should touch the first one. Um, I'm not sure. It's just a regex. Just a regex. So. Yeah, yeah. Read the manual. It's it's not standard regex. It's it's slightly modified, but hey. Pardon? It's not useful like that. It's not useful like that? Yeah. Because you don't want to put too much time writing a whole line of regex. No, that's right, no. <laughs> it's, it's mostly useful for single character substitution like that, where you've, where you've done one typo, or, or where, you, where you've swapped two characters by mistake. And it's only when your shell is interactive does this work. If you're in a shell script, these things are turned off. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. Okay. Double quotes allow variable expansion and backtick expansion, you know, that dollar parenthesis thing, and arithmetic expansions, which I'm not going to go into. And they, they happen inside the double quotes. So that's cool. Let's try these. H equals foo bar, echo dollar H. We've got quotes there and quotes there, so white space is not special. 
Round there, the dot of H is going to be expanded, isn't it? So what will we see here? Answers? Yeah, you should know. We'll see foobar with a big space in the front, because that's that, that space there. It's actually a tab. What about with this one? Backslash turns off the special meaning of dollar. So we should see dollar of H. If we just do dollar of H, there's no quoting there. So what's going to happen to... We'll just say foobar with no special space done. The last ones you can try yourself. But you can probably predict what they're going to do by now. I'm spending a lot of time on quoting because this is the thing that beginners, beginning shells programmers always get wrong. <laughs> this one's interesting. It shows the use of the, the, the parentheses, the, the braces. Dollar HX. HX is a separate variable. So if you want to put X on the end of your dollar H, then you've got to use the, the, the braces. And again, you can put double quotes around there to preserve the white space. And you can choose whether you put the double quotes there and there, or there and there. Your choice, it doesn't make any difference in this case. Can you also put multiple variables inside of the parentheses in the last example? Uh, inside there? Yep. No. There is a way in that you can put a variable name in there and have it expanded as a variable and then re-execute the whole line. So you can use an indirection using eval. But that's beyond the scope of this tutorial. You can't do that. It might be a batch extension, I don't know. Okay. Now we're going to start talking about grouping. This is where things start getting interesting. Parentheses start a subshell. So this is like forking the current shell. So you've got a separate process that's doing stuff for you. What you can do in here is you can change directory and you can set variables and you can change redirections inside that subshell and it doesn't affect the parent at all. That's useful, for example, in make, where you want to do something and then come back to where you are now. So, here's an example. CD to slash, echo star and ls, and pipe the whole lot through less. When you finish that command, your current directory has not changed, because only the subshell's current directory has changed. That's a really stupid example. Braces, just start a simple group. Again, you can redirect output of the whole thing as a group, but changes made inside that, those braces are effective on the current shell. So here's an example. What we want to do here is put um, a header above the password file. So we'll echo the header, cat the password file and pipe the whole lot through less. You'll note when we get to shell functions, that they are delimited with braces because they do not start a subshell and they are the same um, well they don't usually start a subshell and so they are the same shell as the, as the thing that calls them and so you can make changes inside a function that is effective in your current environment. So essentially it will roughly the same as, uh, as the braces in C so basically thread the whole component as a single uh, Yes. It's almost exactly the same as the braces in C, and I suspect that's where the Bourne shell people got it from. So, here documents. This one's interesting too. Sometimes you want to put something which is more than just a line into something. The here document lets you do that. Um, for some reason, the white space there has disappeared in the slide, which is a problem. Um, but what we have here is the cat command, and it's taking as input all of this stuff and putting it onto standard error. The general format of this is from from some string. Preferably one without white space, otherwise you confuse yourself. The shell takes as input to the command 
anything that's between that string and a line with just that string on the line of the tone. There are two changes. If you put a dash at the beginning of the string, where's my brick? If you put a dash at the beginning, it'll strip tabs from the beginning of the line, of each line inside the, 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 the here document. If you quote any part of the string, whether with double quotes, single quotes, or a backslash, then you won't get any expansion inside the here document. If you don't do that, then variables are expanded. Command expansion happens, so your back ticks and your dollar parentheses work. Do yeah, parentheses. And that's really useful when you want to build a document and then dump it out. I've used this for writing CGI commands using the shell. And you generally have your big template with dollar blah for things to do inside, and then you set the variables, and then as the last thing in your, in your um, shell script, you cat from the here document, which is just the template with all the variables there, and it just happens. Pretty neat. Yep? There's another here document documented in manu manual of the bash. What does that actually do, the tree of this? Three? It says usually, no, in the bash manual itself, and it says for non-interactive modes. Non-interactive modes? I have no idea. Yeah, there are three. It must be a bash extension. Okay. So here documents. Here's an example that I would like of a pipeline. The idea of a pipeline is you take the standard output of one command and pipe it into the standard input of the next one along. Standard error still goes to wherever standard error went beforehand. I want you to try this. Um, if you're running on an Ubuntu or Debian system, you'll need to put an extra star slash there. Because user share doc contains directories, not files. On the system I originally developed these slides on, it was, it, it was all in there. So please do this, and we'll see what's going, going on. Um, I'll go through it one step at a time while you're typing it in. Cat is just concatenate files. So this expands to all of the .txt and .htmm files that are in anywhere inside user share doc, whatever. We then pipe that through a TR. TR stands for transliterate characters. It takes two arguments. Anything that's found in the first set will be changed to the corresponding letter in the second set. So in this case, we're changing uppercase to lowercase. The next one, the C says complement the set. S says squash the set. So what the effect of that is to change anything that isn't an A to Z into a new line. So the TR works on those two sets of the same size. What happens if I do, for example, TR A to Z into A to I? It used to be a syntax error for the TR. I think it actually does something more sensible now, but I can't remember what it actually does. I, I, it might extend the last letter in the shorter one to be the, the full set. But you expect a bijection between the two sets. Okay, just use a different one. Use something with lots of text files in it. Uh, and the final thing, sort dash u says sort these alphabetically, and then spit out only one instance of each set of rep rep repeats. This was the way that the first spelling program on Unix was developed back in 1970 something. Um, at that stage, AT&T was beginning to use Unix extensively internally for document processing. And they found that people couldn't spell, or they had lots of typos. And they wanted a way to pick up lots of typos. So they had this massive corpus of already proofread documents. They ran a script almost exactly the same as this is, but instead of onto temp words, it was user, user lib words or user dict words, or user share dict words, or whatever the current thing was. Then, you can run just these bits on your document that you want to spell check, and then write a very simple program that says, spit me out all the words that are in your document you're trying to check that are not in the, the master word list. Then you can look for those in your editor and fix them, or add them to the word list. And that was how the very first spelling check in Unix was built. Neat, eh? Okay, so do you, do you have the word list now? You can have a look at it? Because we're going to be using that in a minute. Control flow. Shell has while, until, if, case, and for. It's also got select, which is not very useful. 
Um, they all do what you'd expect them to do, except that their argument, as we've already, except for four, is a command. So, if grep zoom in temp words, and we're going to throw away the output entirely, dev null is a special file that just swallows anything you send to it and throws it away. It used to be called dev rat hole a very long time ago. If you've got grep minus q, you can do the same thing. Um, I found that your mileage may vary. On some systems, grep minus q is there and works. On other systems, it means something different. Yeah. Yeah. So, explicitly redirecting always works. Um, so, if zoom is in your word list, then you'll see that. Otherwise, slow. We can't zoom. Yep. Um, it took me a while to understand what the additional redirects after dev now. Uh, yep. Um, that said, said standard error goes to um, file descriptor one as well, as I showed you earlier. Sure. Yeah. Good. Anything more on this one? Very boring. Four iterates over its argument list. So you can say four x in a, b, c, and you'll have a, b, c. We saw this earlier without the in a, b, c, and if it's not that, it iterates over that thing. That's a special variable which corresponds to all of the shell's arguments quoted with double quotes. There are actually two special ones. Um, Not, in, not including the shell command. Um, that's available as dollar zero, but it never actually comes in. Dollar star gives you all of the arguments to the shell, but it throws away white space, so it's not very useful. Dollar at is almost always what you want to use, uh, and always in quotes. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I thought I had another while in here somewhere. All right, this is a more complicated one. This introduces shell functions. You'll find this in your examples directory if it's too difficult to look at it on the screen. Uh, and uh, I, think, I think it's called isup.sh or something like that. What we have here is a shell function. A shell function is the name of the function followed by, parent followed by uh, parentheses and then a group. When you, execute a, when you invoke a shell function, it works exactly the same way as invoking a shell script from the point of view of being inside it. So the arguments to the shell function are $1, $2, $3, and $at, as, as before. Do you ever put anything between the parentheses? No, you can never put anything between the parentheses. So it's just syntactical? It's just syntactically to say this is a function. Right. There used to be a function keyword that you put on the beginning there. But if you use that, it's not positively compliant and dash will complain. Okay, so here, what we're going to try and do is, when I'm, I'm, I've, got a, I've got a cluster at home, uh, at work rather. It's got 10 machines, and every now and then one of them falls over, or falls off the network because someone's been doing something stupid, or someone's actually not gone through the machine booking system and configured it with BSD when I wanted to be Linux, or something like that. In all of those cases, it's got a different address, so I can't SSH to it and, and do stuff. So I want to find out whether my cluster's all there and usable. It's usable in my terms if I can SSH to it and put commands on the cluster. So, how do I do that? Well, we're going to do some magic. We're going to call SSH one and sleep one second. And we're going to put an ampersand at the end so that happens in parallel with everything else. We're going to save the process ID in this, file, this variable pin. $bang is the process ID of the last asynchronously executed command. We're then going to start a subshell which sleeps for 15 seconds, I figure if it hasn't done its key exchange and done a sleep within 15 seconds, the machine's gone away. It's not responsible enough for me anyway. So we'll do that, and we'll do that one in the background as well. And then we'll wait for that process to finish. The exit that status of this whole thing is the exit status of the last command that got executed, which in this case is the wait. The exit status of wait is the exit status of the command it waited for. So, if the SSH succeeds, it'll exit zero, and wait will return zero. 
If it fails, then it'll still be doing its key exchange and mucking around and not being able to talk to it or not being able to resolve it on the DNS or whatever. And it'll get killed here. If it's killed, it'll have a non-zero exit, non exit status. So the exit status of is up is zero if this is actually succeeded, and non-zero if it failed. Neat? Okay. And the question is, at what point does the bash rip children? That is, uh, technically the PID could have been, what could have finished the PID reused? No. Um, bash, bash reaps its children when you explicitly do a wait. Or, if you're in an interactive shell, before it prints out the prompt. So, if I do a synchronous thing without ever doing wait... Then they'll just remain zombies. Not necessarily. So, it's not an issue, because even if it reaps it before, before that happens, it'll still, as far as Bash is concerned, it'll still have this structure sitting there. For yeah, the it'll remember it. When you next do a wait, you won't actually have to reap anything, it'll just get the same state out. Yeah, it's a shortcut. Yeah, yeah. Bash does that. Some of the other shells don't. Okay. Yeah, anything with job control is supposed to. Not all shells have job control. <laughs> all right. In particular, Ash doesn't. Ash just Ash just leaves it there, and 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 um, when you wait or when the shell exits, then it'll all be picked up. You can explicitly do that by making it a, a grandchild of the shell, and then in it will pick it up. Yeah, you should really wait and, and find out whether things happened. Anyway, um, this is no good just as a, shell script, as a shell function. You need to be able to call it. So, as I said, I've got a cluster. So I'm going to call it in this loop. I'm going to say for x, and that will iterate over all the commands of the whole shell script. Do, and we're going to have another one here. And this time we're going to save file descriptor. Sorry, we're going to put the output of that thing onto file descriptor 3. We're going to make 3 the same as 1, but we're going to make file descriptor 1 for this slot dev tty. That's so that that SSH, the first time it hits, can ask for a password if it needs to. Ask for a key, a key password. And hope you're typing fast. <laughs> yeah. And we'll save the process IDs of this bit here in the PIDs variable. So what this does is it says, take expand PIDs and put dollar bang on the end of it with a space in between. So now we've got a, a, a list of numbers, and each time through that loop, we'll add another one on the end. Very common shell idiom. And then we'll call that like this. And sorry, after that, we'll do this. We'll set ret equal to zero so we can remember what, where we are. And we'll iterate through all of those and wait for it to collect the exit status. If any of those exit stages is non-zero, we'll set ret to non-zero and exit with that. So the result is, I can say is up, tinny1, tinny2, tinny3, tinny4, tinny5, tinny6, and it will do it to all of them, and it will exit non-zero if any one of them was down. Did we have a question over here? No, okay, cool. An example. So we've talked about the shell arguments a bit. Watch the quoting, always watch the quoting. The other way of iterating over arguments is to use shift. So this is the same script we used before, but this time we're going to use while and shift. Test $1 will exit non-zero if $1 is the empty string. So this will then iterate over all of the arguments, each time throwing away an argument. So again, shift, renames $2 to $1, $3 to $2, $4 to $3, and so on. And the previously inaccessible tenth argument becomes $9. And the old $1 is thrown away and you can't find it anymore. You can give shift a number to say throw away n arguments if you want to. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I should have used a test dash dash in there, but hey. Dash n. Or dash n, yeah, whatever. 
dash n says the number of, is the length, but yeah. Okay, there's a number of things that I see over and over again and I hate. Here's one of them. Cat for a single file pipe through a pipeline. Totally unnecessary. All you're doing is creating yet another process that's got to be shift, uh, multiplexed with the rest of the pipeline. And instead of just uh, allowing your um, first process in this pipeline to use a huge buffer and just read stuff in, you're forcing it to go through whatever pipe buff size is, typically 4K, one page. Uh, and so you lose performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's laziness. <laughs> Don't do it in a script. <laughs> um, minimize external operations. Do expensive operations only once, as far as possible. And that normally means re redoing your thing as a pipeline. And normally, if you're using while followed by read, read, read standard input and assigns things to variables in a loop that's going to do any more than maybe two or three iterations, you're doing it wrong. Do it a different way. Always try to rework your ideas as a pipeline. Let me give you an example. Let's say we want to count the number of shell scripts on a system. Xargs is your friend. What this does, find is your universal way of finding files. We're going to start at the root directory, look for all ordinary files that I've got at least one execute bit set, and print their um, names separated by the null character. We then use xargs. xargs turns its standard input into a list of arguments, which you can then put to the file command. Dash zero says my standard input is delimited by nulls. If you don't have that, it'll assume it's delimited by spaces. And that's evil if you've got spaces, spaces in your file names. And then we can just look for text executable and count how many there are. And they're actually quite a lot. Um, there are fewer than there used to be. What seems to happen is that people have some idea and they implement something as a shell script. And that gets out there and gets used and it gets used, and then someone has the right idea, this thing's being used so much, I can make it more efficient if I write it as a C program. So they write it as a C program, it's a nice small little C program. And then somebody else decides, um, that's ancient C, let's, let's link it with the GTK's toolkit. And then you end up with this huge program that did what that three-line shell script used to do. Yeah, anyway, um, enough typing. If you try this, you'll see that you've got somewhere between a dozen and a few hundred lines there. Another example. Um, one of the things I do sometimes is build file system images that I want to deploy onto an embedded system. One of the things I want to make really sure of is that that file system has all the shared libraries it needs. So, originally I stole the puppy Linux code. It iterated over all the possible executables, then tested each one, and for each one that it tested, it would then run a, a while, another while loop that iterated over the things and worked out which shared libraries we had and would test. So it was order n cubed in the number of executables and shared libraries we had. Evil. It took four hours to run. So I recast it as a shell script, like this. Um, Again, same find, same file, but this time we're going to look for elf executable, which is dynamic. So we end up with all the, and, and this, this, is, this magic said line um, will replace that with the file name and won't print out anything that isn't, isn't, uh, doesn't match that string. Said is a really useful tool. I strongly recommend you read the manual and learn it separately, some, some other tutorial. We're then going to xargs root, so we've got to be running as root for this, which I don't like so much. And we'll run LDD. LDD says, tell me what shared libraries you use. We'll run the result through a little awk script to find which file script, which ones are not, not found. This took three minutes to run. 
Yes, this is pl implies same architecture. I happen to be um, using a, uh, what was the thing? It was a sock with an atom in the middle of it. Uh, it's actually a cut down atom with 486 instructions, but hey. <laughs> uh, same deal. Um, cleaning up your droppings. Quite often you want to create temporary files. You don't want those temporary files still to be hanging around after your shell script exits. Trap is your friend. What trap does is it takes a command and executes it under one of a number of conditions. Those conditions are typically signals. So here I've got zero, which is a magic number which says when this shell script exits. When this shell script exits, execute that command. And we're going to wrap that into a nice little shell script so we can remember what the names of the files we've created are. Dollar dollar is another special shell variable that has the process ID of the currently running shell in it. So this creates a temporary file and so on. So, easy. What, I didn't hear what you said about dollar dollar, sorry. It's the process ID of the currently running shell. So it's essentially a random number. And in fact, you could use dollar vans there to, to get a random number out if you wanted to. Get opts, um, something I really hate but have to use all the time. Sometimes you want to do parsing uh, of dash x arguments and so forth. There's a get ops built in in the shell that works almost exactly the same way as get ops in C. Um, you say while get ops and then an option string and then the name of a variable. Then you can do case dollar C in n and you can get the, op the value of the optional argument in optarg. Opt end is where you're up to so far. So after all this script, opt end contains the number of variables that you've already, the number of parameters you've already um, used from the shell. So if we shift them, we can throw away, and we've got all the non-option arguments ready to use. Any questions about that? Okay. Does it deal with dash dash? Yes. Um, if it finds an unrecognized argument, it gives you uh, a question mark in C. And so that, that the, the case there calls the usage shell script to, to, to print something out. Okay, take a look in the shell 2 examples directory. Um, we're going to look at a complete example called finger. Uh, it's with a capital finger thing. This one is, it uses a lot of the things we've already seen but sticks them together in a more interesting way. We've got two functions. To, sorry, the. Um, I don't know. How do I complete increase the font on a terminal? Control plus. Does that work? Nope, doesn't work. Pardon? I'm just on a on a on a console. Is it the chip font? I've never done this. Switch to a graphical terminal? Oh, I suppose I could do that, yeah. I sort of need to, to kill the, 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 the presentation to do this as well. Um, let me think. No, 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 that doesn't work. Uh, three nine five seven. Okay. That better. So that I can't see what I'm doing now. <laughs> um, Okay, so we've got the magic bit at the top first. Every shell script will have something like this at the beginning. 
That's interpreted by the kernel. It's the only bit of this thing that's interpreted by the kernel is that first two characters. What that, that hash bang says is this is a script. And the name of the interpreter for this script is whatever comes after that. In this case, hash bin hash sh. Alright? Base name says take this string that looks like a file name and throw away all the directory components and just give me the thing on the end. Some shells do that for you, most don't anymore. So $0, which is supposed to be the name of the executable that's being executed, will contain the full path name to this script. So we're going to throw away that and just give a program name. We're going to use that for uh, error handling. So here, error just prints out whatever its arguments are to file descriptor 2, that's the standard error, and then exits. So now we can have a usage command, which just calls echo usage.frogname and then name, and that's the usage for this particular function. Finger, UID, uh, login name, and it will do something for you. Alright? Let's go down a little bit. Finger 1 does one bit of finger. So, what we're going to do is we're going to save the key, save the value of IFS, because we're inside a shell's function, so any changes we make here are going to be visible outside. So we need to save IFS so we can put it back again afterwards. Um, set it to colon so we can get in password. Um, we saw that bit before. This time we're going to error out if we can't find the key. Then we'll read login name, password, UID, all those things. Read says read things from standard input and assign the first word to the first variable of the line and so on and assign everything on the end of the line to the last variable. So in this case I'm hoping that we have exactly seven fields inside the password file which is normal. Um, I said before that if you use while read you're probably doing it wrong. In this case I'm only expecting one or maybe two keys that are the same inside the password file. In fact, it's normally an error if you have more than one entry with the same UID, so with the same login name inside a password file, because you find the key. Okay, so we'll do the same thing with the GCOS field. Has anybody ever wondered why GCOS is called GCOS? It's because when they were developing Unix, they were cross-compiling everything on a Honeywell system which ran an operating system called GCOS for General Electric Corporation's operating system, GCOS. And it had a different set of credentials and they were stored in the GCOS field. So you could do cross... Um, the equivalent of SSH, but it wasn't SSH back in those days, it was, it was via a serial port and, and login things. So, that's that. So we can grab the login from the login name, which was there, the directory from $home, that's the home directory, the office, you grab that out of the GCOS field, which you reset there. You note we're using the defaulting mechanism, so we can say unknown if we don't know what it was, in $3, $4. A lot of people, a lot of system admins now don't fill in the full GCOS fields. Um, then we'll reset IFS, and we're going to go to who to find out whether the person's logged in or not. You'll note that we set the LC time equals C. That's so that we've got a standard format for whose time fields. Who tells you when the person logged in? If you don't have LC time equals C, it'll print out the time in whatever locale the current user is in, which could be, I don't know, Estonian backwards, whatever, notation. Uh, you don't know. It could just be the Gregorian number of the current second. Uh, you just don't know. So you set LC time equals C, and then you're guaranteed to use the C locale, and then you can parse it. And again, we'll set dollar on, and we know which bits of who make sense, and we can print them all out in a nice, pretty, pretty way. Otherwise, we'll use last, and last says when the person last logged in. Uh, in this case, we're going to throw away some, some bits, some lines we don't care about. And do the same thing. All right? Finally, we'll look at a file called .plan in your home directory. Yeah? Ten minutes, good. 
And if it's there, we'll show it. If it's not there, we'll print, uh, if it's not accessible, we'll print private plan, otherwise we'll print no plan. This is more or less what the finger command normally does. Okay, if there's no arguments, we've just done finger, we'll execute w instead, which says who's on the system right now. Remember, exec replaces the current shell script with whatever that command does. So, otherwise, if we don't have a command, any, if we don't have exactly one anymore, we'll do it. Otherwise, we'll, we'll, we'll go through them all and call finger one on each one to display the information. Cool? And that's how you might implement finger. Let me see if I can get back... Uh, no, drat. I don't know what line I was up to now. 65. Pardon? 65? Oh, it's going to be more than that. I can't even see my thing. Yeah, that's bogus. I think it's about 100. Yeah. Okay. Now we come to the very final bit. We've got about eight minutes left. Um, what we want to do is create a shell script to find a single fable chosen at random from ESOP 11.txt. ESOP 11.txt comes straight out of the, the Gutenberg thingy. I've actually cleaned it up a little bit so the, the spacing is uh, consistent all the way through the file. If you tell that to that port, you'll get an idea of what it's supposed to do. Okay. Go back to full screen mode. Well, oh, this is ridiculous. IPv6 is broken. IPv6 is broken? Yeah, this is not working. Yeah, try minus four. It's meant to be listening on IPv6 as well. Now maybe it will work. Yay! Good. And which page are we on? Yeah, I think I'm going to have to. You've seen all this. Oh, I hate this. And it's all going out into internet land. Let me go to where we were. Anyway, um, there's, there's a number of different ways you might want to do this. Um, can anybody suggest any ways where you might want to grab, might be able to grab just one of those and do it reasonably efficiently inside the shell script? I right, carry on this thing. Okay. Here's some possibilities. You could count the number of lines in the file. Choose one at random, search backwards to the beginning of a fable, then print out to the end of the fable. If you did that every time, it would be really, really slow. For one thing, seeking backwards is, is relatively slow in a pipeline. You can't do it, so you need to use some other mechanism. Um, and for second, it's horrible. So let's instead, let's create an index to all the fables, generate a random number into that index, pull that out, and use the line numbers that are in there. So, inside shell solutions, there are two different ways of doing it. Don't bother doing this. Um, there's a file inside your examples called get solutions. Run that script and it should get them for you. And then you could have a look at two ways that I did it because we've run out of time. I was, gonna, I was hoping that we'd get to the point where you could actually do this for yourself but we've run out of time. So you can get the solutions instead. And there's an exercise for you to do at home. For Fable, take an optional argument to specify which fable you're going to do. You might want to do a string so you can search for a particular string or easier would be just take a number and just print out that particular one. There are a couple of uh, said features I'm using, if I can go back to the whiteboard, that are very, very useful. Um, oh, drat. I left the, all the whiteboard markers over here. The general form of a sed command is sed 
arguments dash something um, address comma address command right so if I say said dash n 30 comma 40 p and then some file name it'll print out lines 30 to 40 dash n says don't print any lines that don't match something because the default is for it to print every line it doesn't operate on 30 comma 40 says start at line 30 go on to line 40 and print them all you need that for this kind of thing but apart from that, do you want me to set through the, the program or can you read it for yourself and understand it? Have you had, want to have a look? Yeah, does it make sense? It's pretty short actually. There are three different indexing programs, all do it in different ways. One's entirely in shell and one uses awk. If you time them, you'll find the one using awk runs much faster than the other ones. Sometimes shell is just not the right tool for the job. So. Yeah, I've already talked about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, we've already talked about all this stuff, so I can just leave it off. Um, I'm going to leave that up. They're really, really useful tools. And I think we can just take some questions now. Yes? Back in the um, earlier script, Peter, when, when you were terminating, if you couldn't find the user ID. Yeah. Um, this so when I, when I was terminating, if I couldn't find the user ID, yeah. yeah was, um, you weren't resetting, you weren't setting the um, field delimiter character back, was that? No, I didn't right. need to. Don't need to. Hang on, I can't, I can't find it on here, I've got to look at it in the other ones. Um, because at that point I'm calling exit, yep. and, that and exit it. just gets out of the entire shell. Okay, cool, thank you. Calling exit inside a, um, a function kills the entire shell. If you want to return an exit status from a function, you use return instead. So error, it, the error function in there is essentially print out a standard error and then exit. Yeah. So I'm interested in something is, well, question actually. Uh, return status, uh, you say essentially is a zero and non-zero. Yep. Is there any general use of actual values other than just non-zero? The question is, is there any actual usage of values other than zero and non-zero? The answer is yes but it varies from, st from command to command. If you read the manual page for a particular command, it will tell you what the exit state might mean. The only thing you can guarantee is zero means success and non-zero means failure. You can also generally know that values above 128 means the thing was killed with a signal. And you can extract what the signal is from it. It is very platform specific, yes. Are there any other questions? I was going to ask actually, maybe for the shebang. Um, do you, I've heard a lot of people recommend that you use uh, user bin and, and then like, and like bash or something instead. Would you recommend that? Um, the question is should we use instead of uh, slash bin slash sure, use Do something like that. What this will do is it'll throw away your environment so you can't get anything in the environment and it'll also search for shell in your current path instead of using the one that you know you've got. So if you care about which interpreter, which particular interpreter you use, use this because that will always use the one that's in slash bin slash sure. This will use whichever one is in the user's path first. Yes, that's more for if you've got, it's more for Perl, right? Because some people don't have Perl in user bin, they put it in user local bin or something like that. There's always a bin share, and it's always a POSIX compliant shell. So for shell scripts, always use slash bin slash share if you want a POSIX compliant shell. Then you've got to use bash, yeah. Yeah, that, that was a comment. When to bin switch to bin dash, in, to dash is your standard system shell instead of bash. All the shell scripts with bash extensions in them started failing because they weren't actual shell scripts, they were bash scripts. Um, the POSIX standard, P1003.3, 
on the shell is really readable and a really good resource. It's available online now. The Austin Group put it up, so read it. Google for it, you can find it. Any other questions? I'm afraid somehow we ran out of time. If it is a really priority question, we can take it less than one minute. Oh, I, I was just wondering how it works when you use the square bracket instead of test, the test mark. Oh, yeah, it's exactly the same. But how does Bash, uh, is this just a special syntax rule that available to the closing bracket? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What happens is um, if there's a command called that in user bin, sorry, in bin. And it'll be a link to bin test with the same command. And test looks for a closing thing and says, throw it away. But test doesn't actually have a command, the knob command that is a closing bracket. Yeah. Test itself. Test itself absorbs that and throws it away. OK, everyone. Okay. Thank you for uh, having one of the least possible cell phones going off. Yes. And um, on behalf of myself and this year's LCA team, this is the thank you gift to you. Thank you, Peter. It was a thank nice you. talk. I'm around for the whole conference. And you can also email me if you've got any other questions. Okay. <laughs>